Hey, film fans, I'm Jackie Lynn here with Dave Demris for our latest episode of Was It That Bad? The show where we watch films that might have a bad rap, but actually might be worth a watch. Grab your garlic. We've watched a cheesy vampire movie this week, Innocent Blood, where a seductive vampire temptress prefers bad guys to feed off of, but one bite goes wrong and the head gangster turns into a vampire. Now she and her new lover, a cop, have to stop the boss before he and his army of goons turn into the vampire mob. Our guest tonight is Anthony Dottavio. All right, Dave, was it that bad? All right, so we have a movie with Robert Loja, legendary character actor, arguably most known for the piano scene in Big and plenty of other roles. He was the coach in uh, uh, Necessary Roughness, just a lot of great roles. We have Chaz Palminteri in this movie, who this was about a year before A Bronx Tale. We have um, Anthony LaPaglia, arguably another legendary character actor. This was sandwiched between him and two of my favorite comedies, So I Married an Axe Murderer and Empire Records. We also have Tony Sirico, David Preval, Tony Lip, three legendary actors from The Sopranos. This movie is directed by John Landis, who directed Animal House, uh, Trading Places, Spies Like Us, legendary comedies. This movie should be iconic. How do you make it absolute trash? You add a cheesy <laughs> love story. You make the lead of it. The I'm not too familiar with Anne Paliuru um, from La Femme Nikita, but she's the lead in this movie. And you make it about vampires. So there's a lot, in my opinion, there's a lot of good in this movie, which we'll, we'll talk about. But it was just upon watching it twice, it was, it was just not <laughs> a very good movie. And just for the listeners, Anthony and I do a podcast together where we do we talk about episodes of The Sopranos and the reason we're doing this podcast on this movie was him and I just started chatting about this this movie, talking about different gangster films and obscure mafia movies. So, Anthony, do you still want to talk to me after I made you watch this? Well, I think I'm contractually obligated to talk to you still for at least a few more seasons of Sopranos, <laughs> so I have to. Uh, it was... One of the tougher movies I've had to get through. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it de- definitely had a couple of good moments, but you get a lot of that cheesy 80, 90 gore. Like the scene when um, she takes out Chaz Palminteri in the car. Right. Her kills were, were pretty gruesome. Yes. It didn't age well. I will say that. And the special effects were, and this was right around the time of Terminator 2. So we know what's capable Seem like maybe they didn't have a, a big budget for this. The budget on the film, I believe, was twenty million. Yes, yes, and it was a box office flop. It grossed a little under five. Um, it ha- this has a five point eight on IMDb and a sixty eight percent on Rotten Tomatoes. So it's it's despite everything, fairly has like a fairly average rating. Uh, Jackie, what it out of ten stars? What did you give this? I gave it a six. Oh. <laughs> but you know, you know, you know by now that I'm pretty generous. <laughs> I'm torn. This did have some fun entertainment aspects to it. It definitely felt more than more like an 80s movie to me. Um, it was made in 92. So yeah. close enough. Right. Um, I'm kind of hovering around a four or a five <laughs> for <laughs> this one. I think we're getting closer to the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> Actually. Yeah. We have a lot of, I was just, I just noted we have a lot of the mafia stereotype or the, I don't even know if it was mafia related. It was just like a lot of Italian stereotypes in it that I noticed. Like, I think the only music these guys play in the movie is Sinatra. I we noticed see, that. <laughs> we see of- the scene with um, Chaz Palminteri and Marie and she opens, and then this is dating the movie as well. She opens his CD case and it was just all Sinatra CDs. Anthony, I think I cut you off there for a sec. <laughs> oh, no, I was saying there was a lot of the old Italian music in that. Yeah, that's the, that was the closest to the Italian that you got. 
Um, I thought it ended pretty funny. I think it was like a Jamaican song at the end. I'm not uh, right, right. And I, I should have looked up what the song was, but I was like, when the movie ended and they started, they started playing, <laughs> and they did the the John Landis typical ending of a movie where they they show a scene with a picture of every actor, like they did in Coming to America and Trading Places. They show every every actor and their name. I don't know if John Landis just had because Google wasn't around in 1992, but if it was, I think he would have just said italian things and then just put like okay we'll put this in the movie we'll have this scene with sal and he brings her to his house and he offers her mussels and garlic like wh- what is this and then he plays sinatra he's got the the fireplace going it was just just all these all these stereotypes i think he just he at, in 92 he might have had an assistant say to him um what are things that are italian just please tell, tell me. me something italian what what can we throw in here <laughs> you know, and that's give what, me some ideas what drove me wild too is you you make an italian mafia like a vampire movie italians love garlic you're ruining you're ruining our whole life right there <laughs> <laughs> You know, Roger Ebert had a funny thing to say about that. Um, Let's see where he said, innocent blood is an uncomfortable marriage of vampires and mobsters. It doesn't work on the supernatural or on the criminal level. The payoff in which the gangsters find they've become vampires is an exercise in missed opportunities. (laughs) That I found another review, and I looked this up on Google. It was a two-star review. So this was two out of ten stars. And the user said, I've never actually seen this movie, but I was in it as an extra. I guess he was a little biased. He gave it one, two instead of one because he was in it. So, <laughs> Oh, God. That's it. <laughs> John Landis, after this, didn't really go on to do much more. He had... So he made this movie in 1992. And then after that, he made Beverly Hills Cop 3. But yeah, th- this, was, uh, this was not a very good movie. I remember seeing it when I was a kid, like in 90, this came out in 92. So I would have been like 11, 12 years old at the time. And I remember I liked it, but I, I don't know. But I probably had bad taste then. And, but <laughs> wa- <laughs> watching it twice in a week, it, 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 was, it was tough to get through. And we'll, we'll get through the, uh, the nitpicks and everything, everything wrong with this movie. All right, so we're going to take a quick break, and then we will go into favorite scenes. Hey, everyone, it's Jackie Lynn. Hope you're enjoying this episode of Was It That Bad? If you ever want to try making a podcast, you should definitely check out the app that we use. It's called Anchor, and it's a really easy way to make a podcast for free. It's this great program that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. And let me tell you, as a broadcaster, I'm pretty picky about that. Plus, Anchor distributes the podcast for you to Spotify, Apple, Pocket Cast, and you can make some money with no minimum listenership. It's great. It has everything you need in one place to make a podcast. Definitely worth checking out. Really cool. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. All right, we're back. Favorite scenes. So I have a few listed here. The first one I have down is the opening scene when we're introduced to Sally. And I I thought this was, I had this as quote unquote, the only normal scene in this movie even even though it wasn't it wasn't super normal we're introduced to them we see all the characters um sally does some uh monologue about sally's robert loja in this movie um he's he's arguing with a man who i guess has screwed him over on a truck that they hijacked and he shows him a toaster he has all these like he was trying to make these memorable lines it looks like he goes what's this it's a toaster is it has a it's nice it has a lot of buttons this button pops open he's just saying what a toaster does he's doing a commercial for a toaster and <laughs> he goes you can put anything in here you can put a slice of pizza a pastry um you ever try cooking calzone in a microwave it comes out like a limp dick he's just saying all these <laughs> like ridiculous things and then he, he goes on some rant about koreans so which is kind of racist <laughs> 
and he's 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 like they're getting a chunk of the electronics action before before he smashes the guy's head in with with the toaster while he's begging for his life it was just it was funny because it was the only normal scene in this movie anthony what'd you think of this scene i thought it was actually a really good scene it was it's funny the way he goes into the monologue. Like you said, it was like it was like for an infomercial at first. <laughs> and as he showed the durability when he slammed it on his head a few times, so that was a good thing. It was good product testing. <laughs> <laughs> like you said, it is definitely a normal scene in it because you could see something like that happening in a mobster type movie or show where they have that sit down and like it's like. It's not going to turn out good for somebody. Jackie, what do you think about this scene? I think you guys are describing this well, um, that it was one of the most normal scenes in the movie. Um, but I was really one, I had higher expectations for the microwave oven. Like I didn't know <laughs> if they were going to plug it in and make him stick his hand in there or something. <laughs> or I don't know. I, I thought it was... Um, he could have been a little more creative than just whacking him with a box, but but then right. again, it was it was pretty funny. It was entertaining, and and that line about uh, "Did you ever cook a calzone in the microwave?" You know, it comes out like a limp dick. You know, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's hilarious. I, that I'm like, okay, one liners, right? For it here, okay, monologues and one liners. We're off to a great start. I forgot to mention before the scene, we we're introduced to uh, Tony and Joe, Tony played by Chas Palminteri and Joe by Anthony LaPaglia. And before they walk in, randomly Godzilla is playing on the TV and Tony's like, wait, I love this part. And it's Godzilla biting a man's head off. It, just like just really so random. weird. Just, just like a lot of random shit happens in this movie. So yeah, so this was a funny scene. It was, it, it was, your stereotypical mafia movie scene before the movie kind of goes off the rails shortly after this. Um, ja- Jackie, what's a scene that you liked in this movie? I don't know if I I liked this scene, but <laughs> let's talk about a first impression here with Marie um, and Pal- Parlod. Par- I uh, Perry, I, I tried to look up the pronunciation and um, apologies to her if she's listening. So I'll, <laughs> I'll use my my shitty French language speaking and say Perry Lou. Okay, well, just to give our listeners an idea of what's going on, um, this female lead has an entire scene where she is completely nude. The and I was um, a little surprised. It's not just a shot; it's a right. whole scene of her yeah, yeah. walking around naked. And I'm like, I hope she puts some clothes on for the rest of the movie. And uh, thank goodness she did. <laughs> but yeah, this is um, the opening it, scene in the movie. Yes, this is the opening scene. And this movie is just full of gratuitous nudity. Um, probably a little more than I'd say the aver- average 80s film. Um, it was originally rated NC-17, but they got it bumped down to an R for um, removing a couple of scenes. We have our first steal of the podcast because that was on my accordion, <laughs> the internet. <so>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally fine. Totally fine. I have a couple more. But yeah, I could see. And she's, um, according to her IMDb, she's done like American films, but mostly she's in French cinema. So I don't, I don't not to jump on French stereotypes, but I think they're more comfortable with, with nudity than Americans. So she, it probably wasn't a big deal to her to be naked for I don't know one third of her scenes in this movie. Indeed, yeah, and you just seem- and just the narration, Anthony. I think I cut you off there. Sorry. Oh, good. I said she seemed to enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then she, she just looks. Her as the narrator in the movie is just funny because she looks at the scene. She sees an article about Sally, and she goes talking about how she's hungry, and she says, "I, I think I'll have Italian." I think Just... I'll have Italian. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, good good scene. Kind of like wakes you up, like introduces this movie uh, really hard. Anthony, what's uh, a scene you liked? Well, the scene I like, it's, it's a little bit later on. It's when Sally turns and you see um, his three henchmen coming in, meeting him in the, the icebox. Okay. He has a quote in there. 
like when he's talking about him that he's going off his rocker. I forgot. Uh, I know him as Richie April, but he goes in there talking about that, and he goes, "I can hear an angel fart," and then he bites him. Yes, I thought that was a really good scene. I thought it was funny. You just see the other two, and they're like, "Let's go get dressed," and it's like nothing ever happened. Right, and then I, I thought, yeah, because um, David Preval as who plays That's... Richie April on uh, Sopranos. This this scene was uh, towards the end of the movie, where um, Preval Lenny his character's name in the movie um, yeah. suggests to I, now I forget Kim Coates from sons of anarchy and uh, Tony lip. He's he suggests to them that, you know, maybe we need new leadership because, you know, our boss is now a vampire. <laughs> he says, yes, I, I can hear an angel fart before he, he, uh, I guess, <laughs> well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say wax because he, Lenny comes back to life as a vampire, but yeah, he kill he kills Lenny in that scene. Really? <laughs> He made him into the new family. Yes, yes. This is <laughs> this is when the movie went completely off the rails towards the end. That oh. was really weird where he's just lying around in the meat locker. And yeah. he, he grabs a slab of meat and he turns it into a pillow. And he's just getting all snuggly with the meat. And I'm like, it's just a little gross. I'm not sure what was so comforting about the meat locker for I guess- a vampire. I couldn't really make that connection. The blood, right. Maybe. yeah. I guess the blood, a little bit, yeah. Also, a little tidbit about that: the 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 actor who plays the butcher, that's uh, Sam Raimi, the, okay. the the Spider Man franchise and the new Doctor Strange movie, Evil Dead. So, yeah, good scene. It it was funny towards the end. Um, another scene. At, well, Sal's I have quote unquote death when uh he basically sexually assaults Marie and then finds out what she really is in, in a hard way. This is after he tries to offer her the muscles and they're covered in garlic and the vampire. It was They did selective vampire tropes because she couldn't eat garlic, but she could see herself in the mirror, which it... I want to talk about that. Let's <laughs> go, ahead. go back to that. <laughs> well, <laughs> so yeah, we get bites him. He manages to shoot her, which stops her from killing him completely. And and which which was weird because she shoots her, he shoots her, and I w- I would have thought that that didn't hurt her too much, but it did. It slowed her down enough so he could. She had to leave, and when she bites him, like I said, these these vampire kills were very violent. But what were your thoughts on the vampire tropes, Jackie? There's a lot of vampire rules, and I was trying to figure out what the rules are in this movie. Cause when I like, whenever I watch a, a vampire film uh, going into it, you have to figure out what the rules are and okay. So blood drinking, obviously you get, it's like an infection. Uh-huh. You know? uh, sunlight universal burns them up to a crisp, you know, right. turning into a vampire, you know, typically involves the victim like drinking the uh, biting vampire's blood. Yes. But um, here the victim will turn unless they are killed right away. That's the rule in this movie. There's no drinking. Uh-huh. Uh, and then killing vampires, like you touched on that a little bit. Um, traditionally, like stake through the heart, like that's a very, very common theme. But they don't even talk about, they don't even have stakes in, in this. And um, sometimes, uh, you know, a neck snap will, will kind of just slow them down. But in this movie, it, it killed a vampire um, bullet to the head. Yeah. I've um, never seen them. Ne- I don't believe I've ever seen a vampire movie where that kills, kills a vampire. I always yeah. That killed, stake that to killed the heart. someone in this. Yeah. And um I've never seen such an extreme reaction to garlic. Right. Um, in a vampire movie. Like she was like, it was like kryptonite to her. <laughs> yes. Yeah. She and, was really grossed out by those muscles. Um, it was kind of unusual that you could see her reflection in the mirror. Um, yeah. That's like, that's, that's like one of the top vampires. three vampire tropes that they don't see their reflection in the mirror. And they decided to not go with this one. A lot of these, a lot of these are like missed opportunities. I felt with this film, like it could have been a better mm-hmm. film, but like you guys were touching on with the vampire stuff, the the reflection is the number one thing. That is something that 
is you it's been universal even in the <clears throat> older days when they were doing the Dracula movies and everything, there was never a reflection. So a lot of little details if they would have touched up on could have made the movie a little bit better. Right. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that could have made this movie a little bit better. Yeah, and also to... another tidbit was they didn't use the word vampire in this movie at all. It was it was That's never just what once. I was going to say. Yeah, they never had, threw that I, word around. No, oh, I had that too. Not once was it used. Right, right. So this this was a this was a good scene too. Either I have a couple more scenes written down here, but did it uh, any of you either of you have a any more you wanted to touch on? Uh, uh, one of the scenes was funny for me. It was just like the like the pain and everything when Joe. Uh, Anthony Lapaglia gets really annoyed because of the tail on him. The cop tail is supposed to be watching them, and he throws the, I guess, the trash can through the window of the van. Right. You see all the blood, like it was like the end of the world. He got cut up like it was. I just thought it was hysterical because something like that would never really happen the way that happened. No, not at all. <laughs> overacted on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And at this point, he was still trying to sell that he was in with with Sal and he was really an undercover cop and yeah, he, he was, he definitely, you, you touched on it perfectly. He was definitely overdoing it there. One of my favorite scenes, which actually made me laugh <laughs> was the death by sunlight. I'm pretty sure they spent the entire, but or like 80% of the bar- budget uh, for special effects. This was the... uh, Manny Don Rickles death scene. Yes. Um, okay. In the hospital where um, he's hit by sunlight and <laughs> Yeah. So we see like we see him and he his eye his eyes are hot pink. We see like so many different colors from them as vampires, but Manny's eyes were for some reason they were hot pink. And <laughs> we see like when they open the window and he get just gets eviscerated by the sunlight. N- nobody thinks to close the window. It was <laughs> <laughs> the nurse, his arm detaches itself and it just kind of like crumbles into ashes and she just she drops it on the ground. It was his death scene was Don Rickles death scene in this movie was was really funny. And like everyone's overdoing it tremendously. And he he overdoes it big time in this one. Very funny scene. Let's see. I have one more. I I, I had uh, Sal in the strip club where, you know, this is when the movie just kind of went completely off the rails. Oh, boy. He had turned he turned Lenny David Preval into a vampire and then essentially he just one by one he turns everybody else until they have like a whole army of mafia vampires until Marie and Joe kill them all and this is the end of the movie and it was just yeah this was when the movie just went completely bad shit uh Jackie what did you think of this scene I think it was really funny because the the gangsters were just kind of standing there kind right. of waiting and watching like I mean, I don't even know if they're considering um, being vampires or they're thinking about it, but they're just standing there. Right, right. You see, like, maybe um, that's their best judgment. You see Tony Lip's character, like, watching Kim Coates' character get eaten by Lenny, and he just, like, calmly picks up his gun. Not even like he's like no sense of urgency. He just like slowly raises his arm with his gun before Sal turns him into a vampire too. And then we get the two other guys just calmly walk into the room. Everybody, everybody's like covered in blood, and they're just, yeah, sure. Yeah, they're just but, sitting there. Hey. Let's 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 go. Seems like a nice place to go into. Yeah, yeah, definitely. This this is totally normal. No, nothing to see here. <laughs> but yeah, there's just a this was just a, a, a batshit movie. I have one more part to add to that. Um, yeah. Was was it Lenny who was shot in the foot? Yes. Lenny. Okay. Okay. That was like w- one thing I could not handle in this film. If you shoot somebody in the foot, I'm like, <laughs> ooh. I can't, I, no, I cannot do that. That was awful to watch. But um, on the other hand, um, so he recovers from that really quickly. Apparently he got that medically treated Right. And just got it wrapped up in the cast. And then he shows up a couple scenes later. And it's it's just no problem. He's just walking around with a, a crutch and probably his shattered foot. And 
I guess it comes into play later when he's he's shortly turned into a vampire afterwards and he just kicks his foot against the wall and it smile and like the smile he gives mm-hmm. to the, the bouncer in the club <laughs> yeah <laughs> and he just breaks the cast off and oh well i mean he's a vampire now he so gave he matter. gave like a shrug yeah mm-hmm. one just to touch on that when he gets his foot shot he gets his foot shot by joe and this was a scene where uh sal was about to kill joe by throwing him in the back of a garbage truck and he first he said he has another great one-liner from robert loja sal he says to joe i'm gonna grind you down to blood and screams yikes <laughs> just totally overdoing it there trying to trying to have a memorable line there uh anthony what'd you think about that scene uh, that was what wait, which scene are we talking the the garbage can the... yeah yeah where in this scene we see a lot of deaths uh jacko tony sirico dies in this scene he gets his neck it's broken Car, yeah um what's it called it was a lot of this movie was very overacted <laughs> um, that's the best way to put it this was like you said like you touched on him saying could have went with any other line to make it somewhat decent but yeah, let me blood and screams all right i didn't know you could grind screams but Sure. 1992, <laughs> I was young. It might have been something that they could do. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Definitely so. But yeah, it, just a lot of a lot of was, overdoing it. For a movie that I guess was supposed to be like a drama horror, it, it was really like a comedy. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Yeah, I, and I, I don't think they make any um, discrepancies about that when they do the end credit scene with, with them, as you mentioned before, the Jamaican music playing. I don't think that's something they typically do in a drama or a horror film. All right. So let's, uh, I think either, I think that's it for scenes, right? I don't have it. I don't have any more. Okay, cool. So we'll segue into according to the internet. So one I had was that this movie was originally slated. It was a completely different project. It was slated to be directed by Jack Shoulder, who directed Nightmare on Elm Street. It was set to star... Lara Flynn Boyle as the part of Marie, Dennis Hopper as the part of Sal, Viggo Mortensen as Joe, and Miguel Ferrier as Lenny. This is a completely different movie. Uh, what do you do? You think this would have worked? Been better? Worse? I a lot better actually. Um, the, Dennis Hopper is a much more like Robert Lozier is a good character actor, but absolutely Dennis Hopper is Dennis Hopper. Like he was, he was on an all time high going into the eighties. Like he was making good movie after good movie after good movie. And he was like prolific that time. I, I, I had that in my notes for, as according to the internet as well about the Lara Flynn boy, but th- that completely changes the movie. I think it changes everything and you give it, it might be a better movie. It might be an all in all better movie with those with those, it, and especially with that director, I think it would have been more of a horror feel than a comedy feel. Definitely, I, I agree. Jackie, totally what what do you think of this? I came across the same fact as well. That was the first thing on my list. Okay, so <laughs> we're on so, the same page with that, and um, I agree with both of you. It would have been, I think, it would have been a little bit more of an intense film. A lot more in the horror category, maybe even a little less less campy. Um, That would have been neat. And I'm very biased for Viggo Mortensen. Sure. He can be anything he wants to. And this was 92. So he was um, he was he, he had actually done horror. He was in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 at this point. He was in Young Guns. So he was kind of still up and coming. This was a few years before uh, Lord of the Rings. Was he in Carlito's Way already? He was in Carlito's Way. That was in 93. So this was right before Carlito's Way. Yeah. So, yeah. Th- I, yeah, I, th- I think we all agree this would have been a better movie. I didn't have too much. It just said that Shoulder backed out of the movie due to creative differences. And this, this is when Landis stepped, Landis stepped in. And then we got the movie we got. So, so that's it for that one. Either of you have any internet things? I do have one, okay, uh, and it touches on what you brought up before about Don Rickles' eyes. Okay, eye color was meant to show the moods. Uh, when her eyes lit up red, it was anger. Okay, uh, when her eyes lit up 
blue, I think it was confusion or scared. And I think they said when green was when it was like she was sensual because you saw her eyes turn. I believe it was green during the sex scene with uh, Joe Gennaro, Anthony LaPaglia. Yes. Yes. And one thing I, I, I got to circle back to this, even though it's not that section. Um, her accent when she gets angry or excited. When <laughs> what was that? When <laughs> when. Uh, Joe says to her, you're under arrest and she she goes, stay away or I'll kill you. And she has that accent. It sounds like. Oh, she did switch accents. It was really weird. It sounded like Kermit the Frog on meth and he was kicked in the balls. (laughs) Kind of like the demonic voice. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me ask you. That was weird. I'm going to this movie really quick. Has anybody ever seen the movie House Party 2? A long time ago. So. It reminded me of the scene when the guy turns into a, like a werewolf, like like he, like he thinks of him like that, and that voice just changes. Like rrr, 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 if that's what it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Completely disproportionate for her. Yeah, yeah. It happens. There's two instances in the movie where the accent comes out, and uh, another is when uh, Sal escapes and Joe's grilling her about it. And um, what does she say? She goes, she goes, I fucked up, okay? And the accent comes in again. I'm not even going to attempt to do the accent because it's just, it's like so beyond the pale. But yeah, <laughs> I, I, had, I had to circle back to that one because we didn't mention it. But yeah, that was just, it was a really weird choice by Landis here to go with that accent. Um, I have one more according to the internet. Uh, the studio was worried that uh, Anne, I'm going to fuck up her name again, Anne Paluar, <laughs> her they worried her accent was too strong and they wanted to dub it over with an English accent, but John Landis refused to let that happen. So we, we went with what we did. I had no trouble understanding what she was saying. I thought she was fine. Yeah. He yeah, sounded, her... sounded normal to me. Normal enough. Just a very heavy accent. Another. Yeah. Because mostly she's, I, I said her IMDb before it's mostly French films. So, and it, it's another little tidbit on the internet. And I don't know if it's on the internet, but it said she wasn't comfortable speaking English initially, but I thought she did a fine job. I, I had no trouble understanding anything she was saying. All right. Any more uh, internet stuff? That was all I had. I don't I have was... any. Unless, J- uh, Jack, you have any? I was going to talk about Sam Raimi, but okay. someone brought that up before me. <laughs> We're, ste- we're stealing each other's shit all the time. <laughs> that's I think it's, okay. that's, that's become a, a habit. Also, the coroner wa- who uh, goes to do the uh, autopsy on Sal, that's Frank Oz, the director of What About Bob, um, Little Shop of Horrors. Um, for, um, there's a bunch of other, the score, a bunch of other movies. So that was another director. Landis had this thing where he got his director friends to have bit parts in his movies. That's why we see Sam Raimi. We see Frank, Frank Oz in small parts. Sam Raimi actually went to my high school. Really? Really? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it's kind of a random thing. Okay. All right. It cool. was before my time, but it was All right. fun. Can you get us to the premiere of the new Doctor Strange movie when it comes out? I'll see what I can do. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Uh, we will do... We'll take a another break and we'll come back with trivia all right we are back with some trivia i think we all have a question right i do okay do you want to go yes, first i have one left okay i got a qu- i'll go with my first question all right uh, go ahead now this is uh you touched on two but who were the three famous directors that had some part in the movie one way shape or form Okay, so we have Sam Raimi, we have Frank Oz. Frank Oz. Okay. Um, um, could it possibly be Alfred Hitchcock because he had a very small cameo on a TV screen where they were playing? I believe it was Strangers on a Train. Yes, it, Jackie, correct. No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I got that one. <laughs> All right, good, good job, Jackie. Jackie, you want to go, or you want me to? Um, I'll go. I'll go. go. Distributors decided to rename the film without permission from John Landis. What was the name? The new name of the film was it? A. A French Vampire in America. B. Bloody Marie. Or C. 
vamp stamp? It was A. Yes. Yes, that is correct. All right. All right, here's mine. I will direct it to Anthony. And oh. then Jackie, if he doesn't get it, you could steal. Or you okay. just both give me a guess here. All right, this is like advanced mob movie trivia. Oh. So, okay. That's why I'm directing it to Anthony. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Of course, the Italian. That's very. <laughs> very right you guys like have a show about a mob show. <laughs> I'm I'm canceled. the The Italians are coming for me. All right, so I'm gonna give you a bunch of actors that are in this movie, who played other mafia characters in different movies. Okay. One, one of them is not real. The all the characters are real. The at one of the actors who plays the character is not real. Double points if you could tell me who really played this role. Okay. All right. So here we go. Robert Loja played Eduardo Pritzi in Pritzi's Honor. If you don't know what that movie is, it's a uh, kind of a kind of like this movie. It's with Jack Nicholson and Kinner. they play assassins who fall in love with each other. And the Pritzies, Eduardo Pritzi in this movie, played by Robert Loja, or was he? Um, <laughs> so this is kind of like Mr. and Mrs. Smith of the 80s. This is a movie from, I believe, 1985. So that's okay. one. Okay. Anthony LaPaglia plays Al Capone in Road to Perdition. Okay. Okay. David Preval plays Victor Padishi. In Smoke and Aces. All right. Chaz Palminteri plays Angelo Bruno in Legend, the movie with Tom Hardy where he plays uh, Reggie and Ronald Cray, the okay. English gangsters. Okay. Okay. Tony Lip plays Robert DiBernardo in Gotti. And last one, Tony Sirico plays Toy Torillo in Copland. One of those is not real. Oh. I'm going to I'm going to go Anthony LaPaglia as Capone in Road per- to Perdition, okay? Yeah. All right, Jackie. Um, can you tell me one more time with Smoke and Aces, what was the, the So David Preval, David Preval, the actor who played Lenny in this movie, the guy with the who gets shot in the foot. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, he plays Victor Padishi in Smoke and Aces. Mm, I'm going to say that one just for fun. Jackie, we, we did a podcast on this movie. I, uh... <laughs> okay, that one was not it. Because... <laughs> it was, I thought I was on to something. <laughs> Anthony, we did, we did a podcast, I, I think maybe like three months ago, with, with our friend Marcos on, on Smoke and Aces. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I guess it wasn't the movie was not that memorable to Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> was that right with LaPaglia? No, it was not right with LaPaglia. It was uh, the the false one was Tony Lip. He was not in Gotti. The part of Robert Di Bernardo was played by Frank Vincent, who I'm shocked was not in this movie. I'm so, I, I guess that he was busy that day. I guess so because he was in hmm. every other mob movie from 1990 to 2010. That was a good question. Yeah, yeah. I thought I saw Pritzi's Honor, and I, I, I honestly didn't remember it when I, I was looking at Loja's IMDb just to see. And I remember, okay, yeah, he was in Necessary Roughness, which is a movie I have to rewatch at some point. But yeah, I, I saw Pritzi's Honor. I think probably when I was eleven or twelve years old, so I know nothing about it. And I'm, I think I'm going to rewatch it just to see if it's any good. But I was like, okay, yeah, I remember Loja in this. So that was kind of an obscure reference. This is like, this is a question I wouldn't have got unless I. Well, if I, I, knew, if I didn't write this question, I wouldn't have gotten that it. That was a tough one. Yeah, I yeah. Knew, I knew David Braval was in Smoke and Aces. Yes. And I remember Tony Sirico in Copland. I didn't remember Bull Pagley and Road to Perdition, but it's been a while since I've seen it. Right. Yeah. He, he was in an uncredited role as Capone in that movie. So, yeah. All right. That's, that was a good question. Very Thanks. Good question. Thanks. All right. So, Jackie, what's something good you watched this week? Well, we threw it back a a few years and watched the Transformers movie Bumblebee. Um, It's the reboot directed by Travis Knight. 
not Michael Bay. And so that was a good thing. Um, (laughs) We watched it with my five-year-old son and it was absolutely perfect for him. Um, It was kind of his first big kid movie, you know, like, like not Paw Patrol. And he was (laughs) laughing at all the parts and like, it was the funniest thing in the world to him. And uh, there's this one part where they um, do the zoom out from earth to um, through outer space into this transformer planet. And uh, he just grabs his chair and he's like, Whoa, what is happening? (laughs) (laughs) And it was just mind blowing to him. And, um, you know, I enjoyed the movie in general as an adult. It was a rewatch for me. Okay. And, um, but watching it alongside a child was an entirely new experience. And it was so sweet. That's so awesome. Sweet. And this is with uh, Haley Steinfeld and John Cena, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Haven't seen it. It's on It's on the, the quote unquote list. So, yeah. Anthony, have you seen this movie? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, I, I wasn't really into it after the Transformers kind of rubbed me the wrong way, but I'm keep hearing that it's completely different from them. So I might have to give it a try. Jackie, is this in the Transformers universe or is it just like an adjacent film? Absolutely. We have Bumblebee. We have Optimus Prime. We have all the, the gang here. Um, we just don't have the overinflated, hypersexualized version by Michael Bay. So this was a completely new reboot, really refreshing, just, just fun. Okay. So I'll have to, I'll have to watch this. I'll have to fast track this at some point. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, I also, I have some fresh content too, that I was able to watch. Um, Caught Love and Monsters. Um, That's a new one. I think it's, yeah, it it just came out. Um, Pretty great quality movie effects wise. Um, Okay. Story-wise, uh, cataclysmic events have caused all the um, bugs in the world to mutate into giant bug monsters that actually eat people. Okay. Um, 5% of the population is left on the planet, and this young man decides to leave the bunker that he's been hiding in and journey to um, find his girlfriend from his teenage years. Okay. Yeah. Um, it sounds a little obscure, but it was it was kind of a lighter watch, feel good, um, just enough to be creepy and in genuinely enjoyable film. Okay. All right, cool. I'm looking it up now. It looks like Dylan O'Brien is in it, uh, Jessica Henwick from Game of Thrones, and Michael Rooker, who is always okay, right. mm-hmm. yeah, always a good good time when he's in a movie. All right, cool. This sounds like a good couple of recommendations uh anthony what's something good you watch this week well unfortunately i wasn't as lucky as jackie um i have a three-year-old so i caught the paw patrol movie okay oh yes <laughs> <laughs> me too <laughs> so i had to watch that um which was interesting after seven times of watching it with a three <laughs> <laughs> um i actually caught an older movie as well um that i enjoy um pool hall junkies oh yes oh, um, chaz palmateri's in that as well yes uh great movie it was like a low budget film but it's a great story uh, about a pool hustler it's really really well done um hold on. a couple of people are in it walkins in there yes christopher walken plays a great part in it Rod Steiger. Very good actor. What's his name? Uh, Rosenbaum is in it as well. Yep. Yep. Yeah. This was a, I love this movie. It was, it was really good. I saw it twice in like the early 2000s. It's probably been 15 years since I've seen it, but it was really good. Well, that's what I, I uh, basically watched this week. Not too much more. Like I said, it's very difficult with the kids and, but they started school again, so I should be able to catch up on a lot of things now. All right. All right, cool. I realize that uh, even though I don't have children, I realize you two are much better parents than I would be. Because, <laughs> because I, I, don't th- I don't think I'd be doing Paw Patrol seven times. I'd be like... <laughs> well, I'm, a, I'm terrible when it comes to the parenting department. My kids are watching The Sopranos with me now, so it's... 
my my daughter's asking me how to whack somebody. So it's <laughs> really, really good. Oh man. My All kids right. are just nerds. <laughs> <laughs> we just watch a lot of Star Wars here. No, but it's... that's a good and over here that's a good thing. Nerds are awesome. I'm trying to get my daughter into the Harry Potter series, but it's a little difficult still. She's only eight. Okay. Uh, nice. it's to keep her attention. My son, I just have no shot. So <laughs> All right, cool. So I caught Shang Chi on Thursday. went the went to one of the first showings, and yes. it was so good. This was um, I'm gonna say there's a lot of movies coming out for the rest of the year, but I think this will be in my top ten for 2021. Oh. Just excellent movie, great addition to the MCU. I want to say it was up there as an origin story in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, Simu Liu, the the actor who played Shang Chi, just phenomenal. The action scenes in this were great. Um, we did get it uh, overdone at the end with the CGI in the beginning of the movie. There was a lot of hand to hand combat, and then we got like a CGI fest towards the end. That was my only gripe with it, but the acting in this was was excellent. Um, it's not really a spoiler to say that Ben Kingsley had a part in this because he played the Mandarin in Iron Man three, and which was the Kevin Feige won't deny that, that that was a mistake to do that. So they kind of rectify that here by having him in this movie. And I won't, I won't go into like the role he plays, but he's in this movie and they kind of rectify that mistake and they excellent uh, post and end credit scenes that tie the movie directly to the MCU and lead into future things. So I really like Shang-Chi and I I'd highly recommend going to see it. Dave, I got a question for you. Go for it. I hear good things about this too. How is Aquafina uh, in it? Aquafina, she's great. She's great in everything she's in. She really is. Like she's very good. I want. She looks like she has very good chemistry with him in the movie. Like yeah, trailers and everything. She's I, re- she's really funny. Um, she's. I didn't like Ocean's Eight. I, I didn't think it was a very good movie, but she was yeah. a highlight. I don't have. You, have you seen that either of you? Yeah, I, I saw. That. That I'm sorry. Bad. Okay. Yeah. Did you like it? I saw it. Did you both like it? No, I, that's yeah. why I'm saying I saw it because it was terrible. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was so unnecessary. Yeah, yeah. I didn't think it was good, but I thought she was a highlight of the movie, and she was really good. She was in either of you see the farewell? No. Okay. She was the lead in that, and it was it was excellent. So oh. yeah, so yeah, uh, the farewell with Aquafina was really good. And she's really good. So I'm, I'm glad she's in there as well. All right. And one other movie I saw was Worth. This was a Netflix movie. I don't know if either of you have heard of it. No, not yet. Okay. No. So this. All right. So this is a true story with Michael Keaton and Stanley Tucci. And Keaton plays a lawyer who is tasked with arranging a fund for victims of 9-11, their families. They're, they're, he's arranging payouts for these families, and it's something like 5,000 people that he has to arrange payments for, and it's an equal payment. So he has to determine, you know, does the CEO of this company get the same amount of money as this janitor? And it's everyone's arguing, and he has to negotiate. And Stanley Tucci plays a man who becomes a quote-unquote a sort of representative for the the victims so it's the it's the two of them kind of going head to head and they develop like a friendship through their negotiations and you see them interact with politicians and bureaucrats and sprinkled in there just like you see people recounting their stories of talking to their families as they're in the buildings on 9-11 which is you know this even all these years later shit like that just still guts me so Mm -hmm. So this is on Netflix and it was, it was really well done. I, I would highly recommend it. Michael Keaton, you know, just excellent in everything he does and Stanley, Stanley Tucci as well. So this is one I, I would recommend highly. That sounds like a, that sounds really intense. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was, it was, but it was very well done. So pretty powerful movie. So yeah, so I kind of went, we kind of went two ends of the spectrum there with Shang-Chi and then uh, a nine 11 movie. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh anthony where's uh, someplace people can follow you well um 
We'll be doing it tomorrow, our next show. You can follow us at uh, It's the Jacket um, podcast. We do that. Uh, also, Arcade Wars. You can catch me on Instagram. Um, we have an event coming up September 19th. If you want to check it out, uh, we'll be live streaming most of the day. And that's really it. Or you can catch me on Instagram at Twinkie 730 yeah, those are fun. I, I've I've seen I've seen your streams. Those are those are good to watch. Thank you. You got it, Jackie. Where's some place people can follow you? You can find me on Instagram at Jackie Lynn nine nine point five. Cool, cool. And you can find me on Instagram at ddem two thousand. You can follow the Instagram or Twitter and or Twitter for the show at Was It That Bad Pod, all one word. And Anthony and mine's podcast is called It's the Jacket. It's the Sopranos recap pod. You can follow the Instagram for that at It's the Jacket pod. Also one word. And if you want to talk about movies and or TV with myself, Jackie, Anthony and hundreds of other great people, you can join the movie and television talk Facebook group. Just type that into a group search and wear the red cover photo. Guys, this has been awesome talking about this movie that I'm glad I'm not going to watch again for a very long time. I don't think I'll ever watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'm, I can cross this one off the list. <laughs> uh, Jackie, what movie are we doing next? Next time, we are going to be talking about Speed 2. All right, cool. That'll be pretty exciting, hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Good times. Good talk. See you next time. Thank you. Thanks for listening.